All right, this is the last uh, lecture that I'm uh, giving to help you off the test on Friday. I'm going to be talking about some material in your Shillington book from chapters 18 and uh, 20. Uh, now, for this class, this is basically going to be our last real mention of South Africa because for this class, uh, the two books that we're going to read on modern Africa are going to be placed in the Sudan uh, that's the second book we're going to read on Darfur. And the book that we're going to start reading next week is Things Fall Apart, which takes place in Nigeria. Uh, you know, if you all want to do South Africa, I teach a class on South Africa. And, uh, you know, you're welcome to sign up for that in the future. But for this class, we're going to be looking at West Africa and the Horn of Africa. But I do want to talk a little bit about South Africa in this period leading up to colonialism. Now, unlike the rest of Africa, uh, the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, South Africa was the one part of the continent that had a substantial uh, European uh, colonization. <coughs> now, there were some basic reasons for this. Uh, Southern Africa is south of the tropics. Uh, it has a weather, not exactly like the southern United States, but, but kind of similar uh, in that you have a real winter. It's not a particularly cold winter, but you definitely have a winter in a lot of South Africa. You have frost. Uh, and also, uh, the growing season is not a tropical growing season, uh, especially in the coastal areas. South Africa has, has cold, wet winters and hot, dry summers. Uh, and so uh, the, the growing season is kind of opposite of what it is in tropical Africa at least especially in, 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 in the Western Cape, which is where uh, you first have European settlement. And as some people have mentioned, like, you know, Jared Diamond, who, who wrote a book about 20 years ago talk called Guns, Germs, and Steel, uh, the fact that the Western Cape had a uh, climate that was opposite of the climate that was found in, in most of tropical Africa, it, it made it difficult for... Uh, Bantu-speaking farmers uh, to settle in the Western Cape, which meant that the Western Cape had a lower population density uh, than the rest of Southern Africa, and that facilitated Europeans coming in as they did around 1653 or so. Uh, and so South Africa had a substantial population of Europeans. Uh, uh, South Africa was uh, among Europeans was settled by the Dutch East India Company. Uh, over time, these people became distinctive. They had a further immigration uh, by people from France. The, the Huguenots, these were French Protestants uh, who were forced out of, uh, out, out of France after the King of France uh, reneged on the uh, uh, agreement that had given uh, the, the Huguenots a religious tolerance up until that time. And also later on, there were German immigrants in, who came there. Eventually, uh, by the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, uh, these people would be known as Afrikaners. But during the period of time we're talking about, uh, they were still primarily known as Dutch or Boers. Now, Boer is, is simply the Dutch word for farmer. And the great majority of these people were farmers. Uh, as I said before, they moved into the Western Cape. The, people in the, the indigenous people of the Western Cape the Khoisan people, you know, like when I, sh like the first film of the semester I showed you, where they showed the people, where I showed you people speaking the click language, those were sand people in, in what nowadays is Botswana. Uh, but back several hundred years ago, you had a lot of sand in uh, the Republic of South Africa, and also you had a lot of Khoikhoi uh, people. The Khoikhoi people uh, were genetically the same as the sand people, except for they raised cattle, and because they raised cattle, they consumed a lot of milk and ate a little bit of meat and tended to be a lot bigger, you know, a lot bigger people because they had a lot more uh, steady source of protein and they didn't have to, you know, literally walk 20 miles to catch a one, one, little, one little bitty antelope or something every other day. And so, you know, you eat more protein, you get bigger. Uh, anyway, uh, the bottom line is that from the, from the 1650s, until about 1800, uh, the Africana spread gradually. And, and the reason for this is that 
uh, this is the society in which there was slavery. Uh, the local people, although it was against the law, were, you know, were enslaved. And then also there was an importation of slaves from uh, Malaysia and Indonesia, as well as uh, an importation of slaves from uh, Mozambique and Southeast Africa. And so whites basically saw physical labor as beneath them. You know, uh, South Africa developed what became known as the boss cap culture. That, you know, a white man, with a boss, you know, because in Dutch you spell boss, uh, B-A-A-S. And, uh, but it's pronounced like boss in English, B-O-S-S. And so uh, white man was boss. So therefore, uh, once an area got settled, there was always a push for young white men to go further so they could have their own territory where they could be boss. Now, eventually, th they would run up against the limits of the Western Cape and they began to run into the Khoi Khoi people, I mean, to the uh, uh, Kosa people uh, who were farmers. And unlike the, the, the Khoi Khoi, the, the, they also had uh, metal technology. They had steel. And uh, because they were farmers and because they had steel and uh, in addition to being farmers and cattle herders, they were much more densely populated. And it was a lot harder to move these folks out of the way. Uh, another thing, too, is that they uh, were resistant to smallpox, which the Koi Sam were not, yeah, which has always been an interesting thing to me because the Koi Sam people raise cattle. And so I say any of you all who are biology majors uh, or who are uh, interested in public health or whatever, that might be an interesting thing to read. I don't know if anybody ever wrote a dissertation on that, but I think it would be kind of cool. But anyway, to make a long story short, uh, they began to run into these people. Now, the situation was complicated further by the 1800s, by the fact that uh, you had the Napoleonic Wars going on in Europe, and the British eventually took over the Cape of the Cape Colony for good. They, they went in there in, in, the 1700s, in the 1790s, but they eventually took it over for good after 1806. And so this meant that the Dutch no longer, or the Afrikaners no longer control their territory. Now, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, uh, the British had outlawed the slave trade. And eventually, by 1833, they outlawed slavery. And so Afrikaners really resented this. And so they responded by moving out of the colony, you know, in, you know, east and to the north into the interior of South Africa. <clears throat> and among the Afrikaners, this became known as the Great Trek. Now, the interesting thing is that at the time they did this, this was the same time that a phenomenon known as the Mfakani or the Difakani took place. This was a period in which there was extended warfare in the interior of Africa. And there was a great deal of dispersal uh, of the population. So when the Afrikaners went east, uh, when they went north, they quite often found places that seemed to be deserted which facilitated them taking it over. However, that was not the case. There were people there, and there was also significant state formation. The most famous state that was developed during this time in, in eastern South Africa uh, was the Zulu Empire. Uh, the most famous leader, of course, uh, was Shaka Zulu, uh, who was eventually assassinated in 1828 before uh, the Afrikaners came there. But the kingdom was still very much in, in, uh, intact when they got there. The other significant... Uh, kingdom that was developed during this time was the Sutu kingdom. And this was ruled by, uh, founded by King Mashweshwe. The Sutu kingdom is, is really uh, centered around what nowadays is the modern day state of Lesotho, which is a country that's completely surrounded by South Africa, but it's an independent country. Lesotho is also kind of neat too, because it's like the one country in Sub-Saharan Africa where you can do, where you can go snow skiing, because Lesotho is a very high altitude country. And so therefore it gets a lot of snow in the wintertime. So, you know, if anybody ever gets an urge to go snowing in July or August, uh, you know, assuming climate change change doesn't mess things up too much, you can go to Lesotho because it's wintertime down there then and you can go skiing. Uh, but anyway, that, that's, that's beside the point. Uh, but the bottom line is that we see the expansion into this area. Uh, and, uh, we see once again uh, that African societies were developing, they were consolidating, uh, they were developing larger political systems. And so the thing I want you all to understand is that, you know, all the way from the Sahel in the, you know, immediately below 
uh, the Sahara, you know, on down to the coast of Africa, uh, all the way down to southern Africa. Uh, you see that there's political development. Uh, people were working to try to increase the size and modernize their societies. Uh, you know, at least at least among those people who had larger state structures. Now, not all people had large state structures. You'll see that when you when you when you read things fall apart. But that's another story. Now, I'm not going to go too much further into South Africa because, like I said, that's not really going to be the focus of this class. Like I said, if you want to get deeper into South Africa, uh, you need to take my class, History 427. Now, I want to switch gears because uh, and, and go to Chapter 20 because the thing to note about Chapter 20 is that, you know, at roughly the same time you have uh, Muslim expansion in the interior of West Africa, Along the coastal area, you see increasing impact from missionaries. And, uh, and, and, in, and in this part of uh, Western Africa, where you have people who uh, live in areas that, you know, uh, like in the coastal enclaves, uh, Europeans control them. You have missionaries. And also in places like Liberia and Sierra Leone, these were territories that were uh, settled. You know, Liberia was founded by the United States uh, you know, colonization society. Uh, Sierra Leone was founded uh, by the British. You know, a number of Africans uh, who, like, for instance, after the uh, war for independence in America, uh, black Americans who helped the British, they eventually moved to Canada. Some of them went to England. But eventually, uh, many of them were sent to Sierra Leone. Uh, also, you had uh, the Maroons. These were slaves that escaped in Jamaica. A number of them agreed to go to Sierra Leone. and But in addition to this, you have what were known as recaptors, because like as I mentioned in the previous film, uh, the pre previous video, the British uh, were patrolling the coast of Africa, and if they caught slaves, you know, they didn't necessarily know where they came from, or they didn't really want to bother to try to find out. So these people were freed and put in Sierra Leone. And so as Shillington mentions in the book, you know, since a lot of these people have been taken from their old societies and found themselves in an entirely new situation, uh, Christianity was very attractive to them because it gave them some kind of foundation. You know, just like uh, Africans in the interior saw Islam as a way for them to kind of reorganize their societies and have a foundation, these Africans on the coast in European-dominated societies found themselves uh, being attracted to Christianity. And also... Just like Islam uh, supplied a, a, a writing system and supplied a, 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 a rationale for, for organizing society, people found this within the Western system too. And so you see a number of uh, very prominent Africans, you know, getting Western education and, uh, you know, be, being very prominent, you know, especially in the period say from about 1830 to about 1870, uh, you have a lot of Africans, you know, in the area of what nowadays is, you know, from, you know, in the area from Sierra Leone through Liberia, through Ghana, into what nowadays is Eastern Nigeria. Uh, you have a lot of educated Africans. And as I mentioned in the previous lecture, uh, one of the major impediments to Europeans really uh, being able to occupy Africa in large numbers during this time was the fact that there was no effective treatment for malaria. And so this meant uh, that Africans were, were very, very, very attractive uh, in, in terms of being uh, administrators in, in, in this part of the world. You know, a good example of this is a person mentioned in the book, a fellow by the name of Africanus Horton. Uh, he uh, was a, a, a young man uh, who uh, came out of Sierra Leone. Uh, his family were, were Igbo, and that you know, which is the same ethnic group that the, that uh, that the book "Things Fall Apart" that we're going to start reading about next week. That the same ethnic group that that uh, is the focus of that story. He was Igbo, and uh, you know, James Africanus Horton. Uh, he went to school people figured out pretty quickly that he was a very smart fellow. And so eventually he, they send him off to Scotland. He gets an education. Uh, he eventually becomes a doctor. And <clears throat> he becomes the chief medical officer in the British Army. Because 
from a practical standpoint, it made sense to have an African doctor because he wasn't going to get, you know, he was not going to die from malaria. You know, he came uh, from uh, eastern Nigeria, a part of Nigeria we have endemic malaria. And so chances are he had the sickle cell trait. And, you know, he didn't actually have sickle cell uh, anemia or he would have died, but he had the trait. And so that meant that, you know, he could deal with Sierra Leone. He, he, you know, he could get about a, a malaria and we're going gonna to kill him the way we would have killed uh, 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 a white doctor from uh, who moved down there without the trait. And so he would go on to become a, a really well-known uh, surgeon and, 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 a, and a guy who published a great deal of research on tropical diseases. Now, what we see is that during this period in the, on the Gold Coast, which is modern-day Ghana, Sierra Leone, uh, and also in Lagos, which is uh, nowadays in eastern Nigeria, and it still is the biggest city in Nigeria, uh, you had a lot of educated Africans who figured that, you know, with Western education and Christianity, they could reorganize their societies and could, uh, you know, modernize them and, you know, perhaps eventually either get independence or autonomy, you know, using Western education as their foundation. Now, what happens is that by the time you get to the 1880s, competition among European countries becomes intense and eventually uh, European leadership decides to colonize Africa. And so that means that these people are unable to uh, really uh, bring their plans to fruition, which is uh, which was unfortunate from their standpoint, because, you know, really, actually, not even Africans, but also not even people born in Africa, but also a lot of people who were from the who were from the Western Hemisphere, like, for instance, Edward Wilmot Blyden, who was originally from the Caribbean, you know, he ends up uh, over in, in, in Liberia, you know, the, which is the American colony. And, you know, he, he sees Africa as a place where black people, you know, from the Americas could come back and, you know, establish themselves in, and live with dignity independent of white domination. And so a lot of these people looked at the coast of West Africa as a place where uh, they could improve the situation of black people. But as I said before, the, the, the eventual growth of colonialism uh, would keep this from happening. Well, anyway, that's kind of an outline of the material from that chapter. Now, remember, the lecture is a guide. Please read all the chapters that I've assigned to you because when you write these essays, I'm expect you to have uh, substantial uh, examples and evidence from the book. And just quoting one or two words from me isn't going to get it. You need to do the reading on your own, too. This is meant to be a guide. Anyway, good luck on the test on Friday. Take care.